dating back to 2007. It was a dream when we started it, and I, I don't think we imagined that it would be continuing this long. If you are involved in the workshop, either as a participant or as a presenter, would you please stand up? I think we have 65 people, 64 or 5 people. And educators, thank you for teaching your students what happens when people fail to accept other people's differences or when they remain bystanders when an injustice occurs. The other arm of our Holocaust education program is bringing Holocaust speakers, mainly survivors, to our community. Magda Brown will be our 20th Holocaust speaker to stand on this stage in 14 years, and 17 of them have been survivors. A huge thank you to the Franciscan Sisters of Perpetual Adoration and their prayer partners who have been praying around the clock for 141 years for prayer requests that come in from all over the world. They have been praying that Magda would remain healthy so she could come to us. Our speakers are always a little bit surprised to hear that it's the sisters' prayers that have been keeping them healthy and not their doctors. <laughs> We're fortunate tonight because we are about to touch history. We're going to learn about history from someone who lived it. Magda is a remarkable human being. She was born in Hungary in, on June 11, 1927, making her 91 years young. She had a very happy childhood until it was sh shattered in March of 1944 when Germany invaded Hungary. She remains a living legacy to perseverance and the hope that humankind may overcome future atrocities by learning from the past. She's going to come out here and tell her story, but before she does, I'm going to tell you a current story about Magda that I think says a whole lot about who she is. Back in uh, October, there was the horrible massacre at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. And a gunman walked in and killed 11 Jews. Magda was scheduled to speak the following night at Chatham University in Pittsburgh. And she was advised not to go because of anti-Semitism. And she said, if there's ever a time that I need to tell my story, it is now. And she boarded that plane. She's a Philly. <laughs> She's affiliated with the Illinois Holocaust Museum in Skokie, and after a long career, 40 years, as a certified medical assistant, she's continued to lecture her, tell her experience and her story worldwide. And now, prepare to fall in love. It's my honor and privilege to introduce Magda Brown, my newest friend. Thank you very much and welcome. And as you heard, my name is Magda Brown. I was born and raised in Hungary at a lovely religious family, and uh, my parents worked very hard to make a living for us. And I was even a spoiled brat because I was the youngest in the family. So nevertheless, the reason I mentioned this part, to make you understand that my childhood wasn't any different than the children in the audience. They did our homework, we didn't do our homework. The same stuff, maybe several years have passed in between the two time frame, but it, it's still the same. So nevertheless, everything was going fine. But in Hungary, as early as in the 1920s, they created an anti-Semitic law, which meant that only 1% of Jewish students would be permitted to higher education. Now visualize this. You, you go through middle school, you go to high school, you have marvelous plans for the future, what university will go, and so on and you cannot do it. Matter of fact, I was working for a physician 
who was also Hungarian, and uh, he also graduated high school in Hungary, couldn't get into medical school, so this is like 1933. So what happens, he goes to Prague, Czechoslovakia, and attends the German University of Prague. So <laughs> that's how life goes ups and downs and turbulent. Anyhow, the Holocaust era, many of you are familiar with the rise of Hitler and his fervent desire to eliminate many people. He didn't like the Jehovah Witnesses, he didn't like the gypsies, the homosexuals, but most fervently, he wanted to eliminate the Jewish people, and his aim was what he called it the final solution. He wanted to create an absolutely perfect, blue-eyed, blonde, perfect people. And unfortunately, he pretty nearly achieved that. So how did that all play out? In Hungary, we were honest citizens. We were protected by the police as well as anybody else. My father was a dedicated soldier of the First World War. But then started coming the anti-Jewish laws. For instance, by the time my brother reached military age, he would enter the Hungarian military, but under different, uh, different circumstances. Because from, from about 1940 on, the Jewish boy would have to enter the military, but were not allowed to wear the country's uniform or bear arms. So they created a Jewish labor force, and these Jewish boys were under the military, and they were treated as brutally as one cannot even imagine. They were given the most menial jobs. I mean, it was awful. So by the time March 1944 came, then I have to use the word hell broke loose because the Nazis invaded Hungary and they were so experienced about moving people from their home into the gas chambers, they were doing it now for 10 years in other European countries. So the other tragedy was with the Hungarian entry of the Nazis that the, the chief bad guy was Adolf Eichmann and he escorted the Nazi troops into Hungary. So with his expertise of moving people out of their homes for the past 10 years, it went like a perfectly planned uh, program. So what they have done, they would take, the, uh, take a flyer, create a flyer, and in it were listed what to do with the people from the moment they will start watching over us. So here it goes. And all this, that flyer was distributed in all the provinces to the police department. So every place knew exactly what to do from one to 10, whatever. So here it goes. March 1994, the Nazis enter Hungary. In less than 10 days, the Jewish agencies are alerted that to, to notify the Jewish people that from that point on, they have to wear a yellow Star of David, and it, it um, has to be sewn very, very tightly on their clothing. Ironically, even tiny little children who really don't know the difference had to wear this. Without this, we were not permitted to go anywhere. So that's nothing. Another couple of days later, the order comes that all the Jewish people will be incarcerated in a ghetto. And here I give a little English lesson. In America, we understand a ghetto is where an ethnic group decides to reside but thank God they have perfect freedom to pick up and move somewhere else. But in reality, it wasn't so. So then they allocated a section of a big city to become the ghetto. And they brought in the people from the uh, suburban uh, areas, small communities, and they were given an order that in one hour's time, pack a little overnight bag and line up on the street and you will go to another location. The, the travel distance could be as many as five miles, 10 miles, 20 miles. And by the way, there was no such a luxury as 
car or train or horse-drawn carriage or whatever, zero. On foot. Now these were sick people, old people, uh, babies, and it was a very, very difficult situation. I happened to live in the big city, and my home became part of the ghetto. So, now we were living in that house, six people. My parents, my brother and I, and an aunt and uncle who lived with us. It was a very comfortable home. Now the, the police area decides that this will be part of the ghetto. So they were escorting these people from their original destination. They would stop in front of my house and shove a bunch of people in. They didn't look how much space there would be, none of that. Ladies and gentlemen, my home became the residency of, for 40 people. You cannot fathom what crowded conditions can be, not only physically but mentally. Because, first of all, you had all ages. Then there were the quiet people, the praying people, the cursing people, and the ones who were really sick. So all these behaviors you had to deal with. Then when you went into a home for the 40 people, they had to find a corner for, to sit down on the floor for their tired bodies, with their little bag. It, it was an indescribable, indescribable, ugly situation. So once this situation was completed, then we could no longer go out anywhere. We couldn't go to a doctor. Of course, jobs were stopped. And uh, ironically, in some of the small communities, there would be one doctor and one pharmacist. And maybe that happened to be both Jewish men. So they, had, they were taking them away, and they didn't worry about, will that community have a doctor available right away? I mean, that was secondary in, on their agenda. So all these things are organized, and we are living in the ghetto for maybe, let's say they came in in March, so maybe till like the end of April. Now we get a new order that we will be taken to another country because they need laborers. What a clever ploy. Because they didn't want us to get unruly if knowing that we're gonna go to the gas chambers. So now, we, like we had the itty bitty overnight bag, and they, on foot, we had to go to the other end of the city. I mean, there were several miles of walking. And some people were very nice. They pulled their curtains down, and there was you know, no bad remarks. But there were some who, who should deserve some bank, spanking. <laughs> so nevertheless, uh, they walked us all the way, like I said, to the other part of town. And we end up in a brickyard. And we couldn't figure out why in heaven's name would they take us to a brickyard. There's absolutely nothing there except bricks. Empty grounds, no housing, no toiletries, no water. Aha. But you see, I word the Holocaust in such fashion. The Holocaust was a premeditated, scientifically coordinated mass murder to the last dot. They took us to the brickyards because it was adjacent to the railroad tracks. And all these big cattle cars that ship animals, they would, uh, it would seat, ha, have about 30 people in it with their little baggage. Ladies and gentlemen, they crowded in as many as 70 to 75 human beings. There were two buckets in the corner, one for toiletry, one for water. They slammed the door on us, and I stood for three continuous days in order to allow my parents to sit on the wooden floor. I was shifting from one end to the other. So now we are, the train starts moving, and every so often it stops at the back of a railroad yard. Because remember, this is wartime, and military trains were crossing back and forth. So they had the priority. So some of the people who would be in the tiny little window would put their hands out to get a cup of water. But people just, whether they were afraid to walk close to us or what other reason, but they didn't come to help. So now we are going to the unknown. 
In the car, there were many tragedies. For instance, there was a nursing mother whose baby died on her bosoms. I am not a doctor to know the, the diagnosis here, but evidently it was the lack of nourishment or the, cl cl the crowded conditions, I will never know. So now we travel and by the way, that bucket of water was never ever refilled. You cannot imagine how the power of thirst can under undertake your whole mentality. You cannot think of anything else, even if you have aching pain anywhere of your body. You are so thirsty that that's all you can focus on. Your, your lips become parched and, and just, if I could have a sip of water. Visualize being without water for three days. I mean, it is unimaginable. Thank God here we are so accustomed to have our baby bottle with us wherever we go. <laughs> but <laughs> I mean, that's how it looks like. But nevertheless, uh, it, it was unimaginably bread. So okay, so finally we, uh, we arrive to an unknown destination. The train stops and some strange looking men with striped uniform open the, the, do the doors and we step out and the order comes, leave all your belongings on the train, you will get it later. Later never comes. So the last stitch of clothing or some memorabilia that we have with us remains on the train. Out. Now comes the most tragic moment of my life. Uh, they, were, they had Nazi officers facing us. They lined us up like soldiers, and the Nazi officer would point at you. You see, we are not human beings anymore. They don't talk to you. And ironically, 99% of the Hungarian speak people spoke fluent German, but that didn't make any difference. So now this officer points at you this way. And my very young looking 42 year old mother who was holding on to me that way. So I waved to her, I said, mother, I'll see you later. Unfortunately, later never comes. By the way, I was put into this cattle car on my 17th birthday, June 11th. So I will never forget, I, I remember every birthday that I have, I should celebrate, but that, that <coughs> memory of my 17th birthday will stay with me forever. So now I just wave to her mother, I see you later. So now they line us up and dog, they organize it into be a unit of like 500 people. Then they had a, an older survivor, meaning that she has a super, uh, prisoner who has been on the, at the camp earlier. So she was assigned to become our supervisor. So it was her job to line us up and count as we were a unit of 500, one, two, three, four, five. Now this counting insanity could take an hour, could take two hours. They were doing this two, three times a day. Now you have to visualize, it's a early dawn, even though it's June already, but it's very cold. We are hungry, we are thirsty, we are tired and cold. So now this supervisor person counts us, 500. Then comes a Nazi soldier and recounts us. Now watch the logic behind this insanity. First of all, we look unrecognizable by this point. Second, we are, well, we had our head shaved and that was the next thing, totally bald. So we look literally unrecognizable. And we entered to a, a camp location that had electrified uh, fences all over. You touched that you were a goner, but they still kept counting us from morning time, night time, sometimes in between. Now the camp itself, was low, had uh, several barracks, they called them the sleeping quarters. So the f group of 500 was put into this barrack. There was absolutely nothing in it, only wooden floor. That's it. So now the supervisor brought us into the barracks for to our earlier sleeping time. And the way we lay down, we would lay down like sardines in the can because that was the only space for that many people. 
at a crack of dawn, like we teach our children, brush your teeth, wash your face, all the necessities of life, zero. As we were in the crumpled up uniform they gave us, that's how we went outside at the crack of dawn to be counted again. Food. It is indescribably horrible. It was a green liquid with some unrecognizable stuff floating in it. Matter of fact, the first day when they handed this little cup full of liquid, we were gagging. I mean, it smelled terrible, it tasted. And the old timers kept asking us, give it to us, give it to us. So we did, but we did it only the first day because that was our only old food. So if you don't drink that, you're out of luck. So, so then came, you know, once we landed there, then came the succession of, like I told you, shaving our head bald, which for a 17-year-old girl, the biggest tragedy that can be. Because the 17-year-olds did the hair fixing a day and night, just like today's 70-year-old. So we weren't any different. So nevertheless, all these insanities are taking place. And shoe was an ex expensive commodity in those days. So they took away our shoes that we came in from home and they gave us, the best way I can describe it, flip-flops. Flip-flop that had a wooden sole and a leather band across the upper foot to hold on to it. It was the most difficult thing to learn to walk in it. So we are there, we ate, we are in the, we have our housing. Now another insanity. We were not permitted to go back to the sleeping quarters from morning till night. It was sit there all empty. We had to be outdoors in a designated area. There wasn't a blade of grass, there wasn't a tree, there was no shade anywhere. And we were permitted to stay a designated area close to our housing quarters. We were not permitted to go to the next housing unit. One time I found my girlfriend over there and I just tried to walk over there. Well, I was slapped on my face, knocked over. I will never forget that. So, I mean, there were all kinds of decisions. You see, we were supervised by former women prison guards. So these women were trained to deal with hard criminals and they treated us the same way or even worse. And of course, the other people say, well, couldn't you resist? Couldn't you fight back? You cannot do that. You are, you know, every couple of yards, there was a soldier with a machine guard on a, on a well, stand somewhere high up, aiming a machine guard at us. And I told you there was the electrified fence. And we looked like terrible. So where could we have escaped? But they kept counting us and counting us and um, too many, too many back things. So anyhow, when we were there for about a couple of days, we started asking the old timers, could you please tell us how soon we can connect with our parents who were directed their way? Inevitably, they raised their hands and pointed to the five chimneys. Well, we saw those chimneys there, they were spewing out heavy black smoke, but there was a very strange burning odor. The best way I can describe it to you, when you kill a chicken and you keep it over a flame to remove the feather, that's the kind of burning we kept smelling. But who figured that such a thing as burning people alive and you know all that stuff? We were in total denial. This is the 20th century. You don't do any barbaric stuff like that. Unfortunately, it was very, very real. Those crematoriums were burning bodies like a, 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 a railroad track, that fast. You know, it was just moving. The minute a unit of people were brought in, they figured how many could be eliminated and how many will have some space for the time being. The ones who were eliminated, you know, they separated us, and uh, the ones who went that away, that was the end of their lives. So uh, all these inhumanities were, were terrible. I mean, we lost contact with the world, we didn't know anything, and, 
And uh, you really were just existing for the moment. You know, just figured, okay, maybe tomorrow will be better. Or, or matter of fact, I happened to have my old high school English, Hungarian teacher in the same group. So we were young girls at rest of them, and this teacher gathered us around her and said, okay, what should we talk about today? Meaning some histor history or something totally removed from the locale. So one time I told her, I said, could we talk about the French Revolution? Don't ask me where I came up with that, <laughs> but I guess maybe I studied that the last time in school, whatever. But you know, she tried to keep us alert and awake of the situation the best she could. So the situation lasted here for about two and a half months. And every day there were selections. The selection meant that one unit of these barracks would have to march in front of a group of Nazi officers. You had to disrobe like halfway. I guarantee you they were not looking for our sexual beauty. They were looking how strong our upper arms are to be good enough for labor. So I was fortunate enough to be selected to the living one. There were the two columns. And the ones who went the other direction never heard about them ever again. So now they threw us into these cattle cars. I have to heighten something that ties in with all this. I do not have a tattoo on my arm. Reason, at this stage, they were so anxious to put some working people into factories that they just shoved us into that car, cattle car and, and uh, put us on the road. We ended up in the general vicinity of Marburg Castle, Frankfurt am Main area. There they had a giant ammunition factory that manufactured bombs and rockets. And uh, so that's where we ended up. And our lifestyle got to be a little bit happier, easier, because they placed us in the World War War deserted or old army camp, which relates to that it had uh, rooms. It had like 16 um, cots of beds, uh, bunk beds uh, in the room, had a table and chair, and ironically, it even had a locker, but we had absolutely nothing to put into the locker. <laughs> so now our life changed around completely as far as being busy, because they divided our group to one, half the group was working day shift, the other half would be working night shift. These were 12 hour work programs very little food and heavy labor because the um, bombs are filled with liquid poisonous material and it was connected to a pipeline within the factory and uh, the pipe would be directed with the filled material in front of your workbench where the bomb was. You had to insert it into the bomb.